Good afternoon and welcome to the editor's podcast for the Journal of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. I'm Dr. Linda Smetzel, our editor-in-chief of the journal. This particular podcast will be focusing on an upcoming journal issue that is devoted solely to women's health. And with me today, I have Dr. Ross Prentiss, who is a professor emeritus in the Cancer Prevention Program, Public Health Sciences Division at the Fred Hutch Cancer Center in Seattle. He, with his colleagues, established the Clinical Coordinating Center for the Women's Health Initiative many years ago and um, was biostatistician for that particular study, the lead biostatistician. And Dr. Yasmin Mazavaramani um, is a registered dietitian and professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Population Health the Division of Health Behavior and Implementation Science at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. She was a co-investigator in the New York Clinical Center Women's Health Initiative Dietary Modification Trial. And I had the honor of working with her at the center here at the University of Iowa when we were doing the Women's Health Initiative several years ago. Welcome to both of you. I, I want to begin initially by just saying a few words about the Women's Health Initiative. It was probably one of the most prominent randomized control trials ever done in US women. And the diet modification arm of that study included 40,000 women. And so my question to begin is, what are some of the lasting discoveries from WHI that make it such a landmark study. All right, uh, Linda, this is Ross Prentice. Thank you for having us on the Women's Health Initiative as a whole, in addition to the diet modification trial that you mentioned, 48,835 participants. Also had two clinical trials of hormone therapy and a calcium and vitamin D supplementation trial. Probably the WHI is best known for the results in the hormone therapy trials, which changed clinical practice in the US and around the world when it was found that health risks exceeded benefits, especially for the combined estrogen and progestin component. And that led to a much, a very substantial reduction in the use of those hormones and there's continued use, but it's at a lower dose. And shorter duration. So we estimate approximately 15,000 women per year in the US, fewer women receiving a breast cancer diagnosis ever since the first of the clinical trials on hormone therapy was published in 2002. So we're very pleased to be part of that. Uh, your podcast today is focusing primarily on the diet modification trial I think Yasmin will elaborate some of the components there. We studied a low fat eating pattern where a goal was to reduce the percent of energy from fat from customary levels around 35% to 20%. And over time and during the planning phase for this work, the addition, additional goals of increasing fruit and vegetables to five or more servings a day and grain servings to six or more saving, servings per day were added. So it really became a low-fat dietary pattern. And I think the, the most important finding from that trial, and I, I could preface it by saying that it, fat and breast cancer serves as a kind of a pivotal test case for how to do, how to learn reliable information on in the nutritional epidemiology area with strong beliefs among persons that are doing uh, observational studies using self-reported diet that they've actually proven that, that fat intake is not important for breast cancer. At the end of the intervention period 2005 and the intervention stopped 
the results for breast cancer weren't quite significant, P equal 0 0.09. So we couldn't declare a breast cancer benefit, but we continued to follow the women. And a few years later in a paper led by our oncology colleague in Los Angeles, Rowan Chablowski, showed that there was a significant reduction in breast cancer mortality, death attributed to breast cancer, P equal 0 0.02. That's the, the key finding. There were also um, findings that were valuable. The women, 40% of the women that were assigned to the low fat eating pattern lost some weight initially, a little over two kilograms. And most of that came back after a few years. The major dietary change was from fat to carbohydrate. And these women did not experience either weight gain, never, over the follow, long-term follow-up period, nor did they experience an, an increase in type 2 diabetes. In fact, um, by the end of the intervention period, there was a reduction in diabetes requiring insulin. It's a small subset of the total, but probably the most important part. And we, we actually didn't get clear results on coronary heart disease, which was the secondary. So colorectal cancer was the co-primary outcome along with breast cancer in the trial. And coronary heart disease was a secondary outcome. During the course of the trial, <clears throat> there was a very major increase in the use of statins. This was not a blinded trial. So women knew which treatment arm they were in and could make change in medications accordingly if they wished. And there were, were differences in the pattern of statin usage between the intervention and comparison group that really confounded our results on that important topic. And just before I stop talking, I'll, I will say that we've done a lot of work in WHI and Yasmin and many other people have been a part of it on trying to introduce biomarkers, intake biomarkers for various components of diet. And we have been able using, primarily using metabolomic profiles in serum and in urine, 24 hour urine, to look at uh, biomarker adjusted intakes in relation to breast cancer and colorectal cancer and coronary heart disease and all the other outcomes that I've alluded to. And those results in actually in larger WHI cohorts, uh, the observational study primarily, which had 91,000 women enrolled, uh, we see a breast cancer risk reduction, which happens to coincide exactly with the result from the randomized clinical trial, only a 6% reduction, but then the reduction in breast cancer mortality was like 22% was the estimate there, so quite substantial. But these biomarker adjusted analyses also demonstrate some uh, benefit for heart disease and for diabetes and actually for colorectal cancer. So colon cancer also. Um, so I will stop there and either let Jasmine add or go to the next question. Okay, thank you so much, Ross. Very nice summary of a, a huge trial um, and um, some of the very important findings from it, thank you. So the next question, um, what would you like to indicate as three overall points on which the diet modification arm of WHI focused. Um, well, this is uh, Yasmin. I'm Yasmin Masavar Romani. Um, and first, I'd like to thank you, Linda, for this wonderful opportunity to talk about WHI. Uh, it's always been a privilege and honor working with you on this trial for the past uh, 30 years. And I wanted to also acknowledge the journal, um, at the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, for publishing important research from the Women's Health Initiative from the very beginning of the trial. Now, uh, regarding the three major goals for the study, um, in 1994 through 1996, so I emphasize that time period, um, 
and what we knew at that time, 19,541 women were assigned to the intervention component of the Women's Health Initiative Dietary Modification Trial. And they were asked to follow a low-fat dietary pattern. So that's, as Ross mentioned, less than 20% of calories from fat, five or more servings of fruits and vegetables daily, and six or more servings of grains daily. So um, participants were assigned to group sessions with eight to 15 other women, and they met um, quite frequently, 18 sessions the first year. It was weekly initially, then every other week, and then monthly, and then quarterly sessions until the end of the study in 2004. So what was it like in the trial? Well, it was quite daunting for women when they first um, came in because they realized that now they had to reduce the fat intake um, to less than half of perhaps they were eating. Um, so that was a big task for them and that they had to stay on the diet uh, for eight to nine years, eight to nine years. So uh, we tried to come up with different um, ways to help the women um, because they, um, even though they just had to follow three goals, it was, um, uh, it was a challenge to achieve. So, um, the study incorporated a motivational interviewing approach rather than a didactic, didactic approach to um, help um, the nutritionists work with the participants to come up with um, a, a go goals that met the study and also was a way that was agreeable to the participants. So in 1998, the entire um, nutrition group across the country, and we were about 100 um, nutritionists were trained in this approach. We had diverse participants from every walk of life um, and race and ethnicity in the U.S. About 20 percent of the participants um, were of uh, minority uh, backgrounds. And, and so we were able to use motivational interviewing and a lot of contact with participants to help participants reach their goals. Self-monitoring of food intake was also another way to help participants stay on track. Uh, we created all kinds of different ways. There were food uh, diaries or picture-based monitoring methods where they would circle the fruits and vegetables and grain intake. We even, uh, and this is back in 1996, we came even came up with an uh, electronic method. It's called the e-scan where uh, participants could um, use a computerized way of keeping track of goals. So in essence, um, this was a challenging study uh, with this sheer size, diversity, and multiple goals. And uh, the accomplishments of the Women's Health Initiative are quite um, extraordinary because we had such a large um, group of participants uh, spread over 40 centers and from very diverse backgrounds. But we learned that a variety of modalities um, can help participants uh, stay engaged, um, uh, this, this included uh, motivational interviewing, self-monitoring, and all kinds of different events um, to keep them going. Thank you, Yasmin. Very, very nice summary of a study that you and I spent many years working together on and um, was a really, um, a, as you use the word extraordinary um, uh, situation for sure. My, my next question is, what findings are more current from participant follow-up in this very same population of women that indicate the importance of the dietary intervention part of the study? So let me begin by uh, thanking all the nutritionists and many of whom are dietitians that administered the intervention program including involvement from Linda and Yasmin, but many others. I think Linda Van Horn had a, a publication, maybe it was in Jan, that listed about 100 or so. Uh, it contributed greatly. So um, the current, more current findings, mainly from longer term follow-up, which is now about 20 years or more than 20 years in average follow-up. I actually alluded to what I see as the, the main findings already. And I think most importantly is a reduction in breast cancer mortality on this low fat uh, intervention, low fat dietary pattern. 
and there there really aren't many interventions and treatments that are known to be able to reduce breast cancer mortality among free living healthy women postmenopausal women so this is excellent and i think puts the whi dietary pattern in the you know, same category as some of the other leading dietary approaches for chronic disease reduction like DASH and Mediterranean diet and others. In terms of possible interest to the participants that are, are patients, that uh, persons listening to this podcast may be counseling or coming in contact with, so in addition, you know, I think the, the fact that um, the switch, the major dietary change was from percent of energy from fat that went down by about 11% in the intervention group to carbohydrate that increased by a similar 10 or 11%. But there was no weight increase. In fact, early weight reduction, there was no diabetes increase. In fact, some evidence of reduction in diabetes requiring insulin with long-term follow-up, we actually see a nominally significant reduction in total diabetes, which is a very large number. So while you know, that may not be fully understood, how a reduction to a higher carbohydrate diet might be favorable for diabetes, that remains to be elucidated, but I think is a noteworthy finding and you know collectively i think although this particular intervention this trial the intervention was never designed to be the low chronic disease risk diet it actually started out there was about a 10-year development period before the women's health initiative was initiated it was more of an etiologic trial of um, of fat, particularly in relation to breast cancer, based on various uh, sources of data that were available in the 1980s and uh, that kind of evolved, as I mentioned, to include the fruit and vegetable and the grains, which I think is are all very good components of a more healthful diet. But there's definitely room for building on this result, the results from this intervention, as well as from some other interventions that have appeared to have favorable results, especially for cardiovascular diseases, to work toward um, an overall favorable uh, yeah. chronic disease risk prevention diet for postmenopausal women. And that could be a priority for the future. I think I'll stop there. And, uh, Thank you so much. I, I, I think it's highly significant that follow-up was possible in the Women's Health Initiative with these important results um, uh, coming up. So thank you for that summary. Next question, what are some future topics that are related to women's health uh, that might be a focus in new research coming, coming along? Yeah, Linda's comment just now about uh, the ability to do long-term follow-up, I think, uh, stimulates a thank you to the 161,800 participants in the Women's Health Initiative as a whole, who were very devoted to the program, very resilient. I think they particularly liked the low-fat diet component. Um, they didn't necessarily like filling up all the forums on <laughs> food frequency questionnaires over and over and so on. But so these, whatever results are emerging, continue to emerge, wouldn't be possible without such a dedicated group. And some of them are great spokesmen for the spokespersons for the program. Um, so I think that topics related to women's health that, that might build upon this and other research um, diet and physical activity as a whole in relation to chronic disease. There's just a lot to be learned there. 
Now, some of my epidemiological friends back a decade or so ago, I would say to them, why aren't you studying diet and chronic disease? And they'd kind of shuffle around a little bit and say, it's too hard. All right, it is hard. And a big part of the reason it's hard is because the, the measurement issues are potentially so dominant. And we know when it comes to total energy intake that, that a self-reported measure is just not useful, whether it's a food record, a food frequency, or a dietary recall. I think there's agreement on that point. There's just major systematic biases related to body shape and age and ethnicity and so on. When it comes to the complementary part of diet, densities for foods or for uh, nutrients standardized by total energy intake, we have much less knowledge. For total energy, we have the knowledge because of very good measurement using an expensive approach to doubly labeled water, but we don't have the comparator of similar quality for you know, the dietary composition as a whole. Um, so that's motivation for studies of biomarkers, intake biomarkers, and metabolomics is, appears to be a source that has a lot of promise. There have been studies for the last 20 years or thereabouts in looking at uh, metabolite concentrations in relation to food intakes. A lot of the work done in Europe is kind of a ponderous process. Those, there are many reports from that suggesting candidate metabolites for various foods, but there's a second validation phase needed before they can be declared to be a, a, a useful intake biomarker. And very little of that work has taken place. The work we've been doing in WHI, the group across the country, of including a number of nutritionally trained colleagues and medical colleagues and epidemiological and so on, we use a different design. We use a design with habitual. We try to approximate habitual diet and give the participants the food and drink. In our case, a two-week period is what we could afford. So we have a good comparator. And we're, we're making, I think, fairly rapid progress in that area. But it's, it's early days. And it, what we're doing doesn't necessarily fit with the mode that other investigators um, in the US and in Europe, for example, are doing. So we have a lot of work to do. And I think diet and physical activity are really the, the big, poorly uh, studied areas that are relevant to chronic disease risk. And physical activity has a lot of the same issues of assessment of activity patterns. You know, you, a lot of work on using accelerometers recently and so on, but even there, I'm not aware of anything that really uh, gives a handle on activity-related energy expenditure from an objective source. I think there's where we have the W labeled water measurement for, for that total energy expenditure, and we have some recent papers, in two recent papers in AJCN, to try to translate that into an actual biomarker for total energy intake. But there's work on diet and physical activity. And I mentioned beginning of my comments, hormone therapy. This was a very major uh, medication in the 1980s early 90s. In fact, I was part of the first paper, I think, on estrogen uh, replacement therapy, so-called uh, estrogen alone and high dose, and that got stopped pretty quick because of a ten, five or ten-fold increase in cancer of the uterus. And then progestin was added to protect the uterus. But the progestin turned out to do a lot of 
things beyond does protect the uterus, but was probably responsible for elevation and um, heart disease and stroke and over the long term, a pretty rapid elevation in breast cancer risk. So, and since that time, as I mentioned, the use of those common preparations has dropped off considerably. Uh, estrogen alone by about 70%, no, sorry, combined uh, hormone, estrogen, progestin by about 70% and estrogen alone by about 40% in the U.S. <clears throat> And also the preparations that are used have turned more to lower dose, shorter term, more emphasis on transdermal estrogens, but none of those have undergone the, the kind of randomized controlled trial with clinical outcomes that we have done for Premarin and Prempro, which incidentally were used by 8 million U.S. women, Premarin and Prempro by 6 million U.S. women and 1993 when WHI got started. So that's that's another future topic where more work is needed. It's hard to get randomized trials funded. Everybody thinks they know the answer in advance. But for something as important as these hormones that affect almost every body tissue and organ, there needs to be best quality data that we can muster. And that's also true, I think, in the, the dietary area, dietary pattern area. So if we're really smart as a community and come up with a good choice of dietary intervention that has the preliminary work to know that the adherence is going to be satisfactory, et cetera, I think that would be a great place for further investment in the health of postmenopausal women. And my last question to Yasmin is, how may what we've been talking about today be of value to practicing RDNs? So based on what Ross has already mentioned to you, that the Women's Health Initiative diet proves to be of great relevance to breast cancer survivors, given that there was almost a 21% reduction in mortality for women who participated in the intervention. So that's a great accomplishment. And uh, this is a diet, the WHI diet is a diet that the, the um, registered dietitians can recommend to participants. There's a background now for a diet that, that worked. So that's one thing that can be applicable also with regard to the type 2 diabetes. Um, Ross also mentioned that the type 2 diabetes recurrent insulin was reduced in the DM intervention group. So that's another application here of the diet. Um, with regard to coronary heart disease, uh, Linda Van Horn actually has done some work on this. And the women who have normotensive, who were normotensive and did not have cardiovascular disease at baseline, but had a high baseline total fat intake, but replaced the fat with carbohydrates and protein had actually a lower coronary heart disease risk. So again, that's another application. So the issue is that um, one type of diet doesn't fit every situation. So we're really now moving into precision nutrition and biomarkers, but there's applications to this Women's Health Initiative dietary pattern to different um, situations. Um, in terms of um, future research, uh, in, in the Women's Health Initiative, the studies have not just been limited to the dietary modification group, but have also included the roughly 93,000 participants in the observational study. For example, uh, we showed that high consumption of artificially sweetened beverages, so that's more than two a day, was associated with increased risk of, of stroke, particularly, particularly the small arterial occlusion type of subtype that affects cognition, coronary, and, and, and also um, higher consumption of artificially sweetened beverages was also associated with increased risk of coronary heart disease and all-cause mortality. So there are there's a lot of data that the Women's Health Initiative has collected. Uh, so that we could even do more research on what's already been collected and connect it to coronary, to um, chronic disease outcomes. Um, Ross alluded to a lot of the biomarker research that needs to be done. A lot of feeding studies need to be done. Um, we also can do more on the microbiome. I know it's a difficult um, 
a type of data to collect. But the gut microbiome is also another um, area of intense research now um, and would be really interesting to know uh, what the gut microbiome of 80 year olds and 90 year olds are like, what helps them stay um, live so long, what is associated with a greater lifespan. In the Women's Health Initiative, we have about 30,000 um, women who are 80 to 89 years of age. About 30,000 are 90 years of, of age, of whom 3,800 are between 95 and 107 years of age. So we it would be really interesting to find out um, through biomarkers whether it's possible to get the gut microbiome as well as all the metabolomic data on what their diet is like, um, and also to find better ways of assessing self-report, um, not just through um, uh, just written ways, but also perhaps an oral assessment um, of their diet. Um, again, um, other areas of research can focus on cognition and preserving eyesight, that, uh, what type of diet is best for um, cognition or preserving preserving eyesight. And um, again, all these, uh, this information is very relevant to dietitians. Um, the, the, again, I wanted to acknowledge the very dedicated participants from all over the country and more than 100 uh, dietitians who made this intervention possible. And the mere fact that 80% uh, of the dietary modification participants consented to non-intervention follow-up after 2004 speaks volumes to the dedication of um, the Women's Health Initiative participants. And lastly, um, in terms of future research, uh, I'd encourage our, uh, our RDs to become involved with the Women's Health Initiative and join one of the scientific interest groups. We have one on nutrition and many on, uh, on others, uh, aging, physical activity. Um, and we would love to have your input because it's with your ideas that we can move forward and find new areas of investigation um, that are relevant to your practice. So again, thank you, Linda, for this wonderful opportunity um, to talk about the Women's Health Initiative and all its accomplishments. Thank you so much, Yasmin, for doing um, a beautiful job of giving us some ideas related to RDNs in a working setting, giving them ideas related to what might be happening in the future relative to research, but then additionally, what they can be doing today in terms of counseling participants as, as they're um, working through the idea of not only improving women's health, but also uh, avoiding uh, disease risk. I, I think that the Women's Health Initiative was a wonderful study that helped us define a lot of what is important relative to women's health and the fact that we were able to follow up these women and that they were so dedicated to continuing and follow up, I think is also quite um, extraordinary. So thank you to both of you for responding to my questions and I appreciate your time in participating in this podcast.